Uh, HDMI. Has anyone done a presentation on, on R yet? Any R presentations? Really? Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> oh shit, let's talk a bit about R. Uh, I talked about Python last time I was here, so I'll talk about R this time. I'm from uh, New Zealand, well I'm from Singapore now, but obviously not got a strong Singaporean accent yet. La. Uh, so, uh, so from New Zealand originally, New Zealand is of course the, uh, the birthplace of the, the R programming language, or really the birthplace of the modern R programming language It was originally born as the S language in the US. Um, so I thought I'd come and talk a bit about doing large scale machine learning. Uh, we have a service called Azure Batch. Uh, we have these things called low priority VMs that are like super cheap. Um, and so even if you've got a really nice workstation at home, there's some cool things you can do with the cloud uh, in terms of doing large scale training. So there's typically two scenarios when you want to work um, in, think of this as really high performance compute. The first is what we'd call embarrassingly parallel. So basically every single one of my tasks can run completely independently from the other. They can go off, they can run, I can ag aggregate the results at the end. Um, we've had some discussion of these, right? Monte Carlo simulations, great example of an embarrassingly parallel workload. So really I'm only bounded by the limitation of my credit card limit in terms of how much I scale this workload up. Uh, transcoding, uh, rendering, we're going to talk a bit shortly about uh, doing things like hyperparameter optimizations and uh, cross-validation, right? If you think about doing a K-fold cross-validation on a model, everybody familiar with K-fold cross-validation? Right? Instead of having a holdout set, run the model five, ten times, hold out a different 20% every time. Is this mic on even? No. It is? This one's on. Why am I wearing this one? Ah! Oh, I thought it was just to make me look silly. <laughs> right, so, so K-fold cross-validation, embarrassingly parallel, right? There is absolutely no reason why you want to sit there twiddling your thumbs while you run every single one of your folds on your local workstation. That's the easy scenario, right? The hardest scenario you could, you could sort of call tightly coupled or, um, you know, it's situations where all of the nodes that are participating in the high, the high performance compute problem need to have some intermediary update of information during the compute process. And did anybody come to my session here last time where we talked a bit about um, doing large scale deep neural network training? I mean, that's a canonical example of having to keep something updated as you go. So literally every time we run a mini batch, every time we need to update the weights across the entire cluster. So in that situation, a compute problem basically turns into a networking problem. I mean, fundamentally, once you start to scale, that large scale deep neural network problem, right, it turns into a networking problem where, where ultimately you are, you are limited in scale in terms of how quickly you can transfer weights or gradients between GPUs and ultimately across the network between GPUs and multiple nodes. So I talked about the second one last time, today I'm going to talk a bit about the first one and we're going to use R because, um, and then often you'll get situations where actually you've got um, hybrid type scenarios where there's stuff that can go on in parallel, i.e. I'm doing a k-fold cross-validation and hyper to, I'm doing k-fold cross-validation to perform hyper-parameter optimization on a neural net that I'm training across multiple GPUs on multiple machines. Right, so typically how you'd like to try and handle that is you might localize the deep neural net training to a single node, so four, five, four to eight GPUs, but then run multiple nodes, each one of those nodes running the fold of a cross-validation, and then run multiple sets of cross-validations, each cross-validation doing hyperparameter optimization. As you can imagine, you're using quite a lot of compute, so it's nice for it to be not too expensive. Uh, so we have this thing called Azure Batch, and Azure Batch is basically a sort of an HPC orchestration layer that sits on top of compute in the Azure cloud. Uh, and it's basically a way of doing 
of really managing large scale distributed jobs, um, either sort of stateful MPI type jobs or stateless embarrassing parallel sorts of things. Um, use it for lots of different things. Uh, we talked last time about doing, um, doing Python and doing stateful stuff with TensorFlow and Horovod. This time we'll talk a little bit about using it uh, with R. Does anybody know the R language? Yeah, see heaps. Who's, why have we not talked about R today? You guys have, it's, it's bias, right? <laughs> it's inherent that they didn't know I was going to talk about R today. I think if I, if I said it, they'd probably say you could just stay on the plane. <laughs> so fundamentally, this is about working in parallel. So some of the key things you might like to do, um, you know, you're trying different network designs, doing hyperparameter tuning, cross-validation, those sorts of things. Um, we have good support and batch for multi-GPU setups uh, and MPI type scenarios. And probably the thing that's most unique uh, in terms of the machines that we have in our cloud is we have InfiniBand in those machines. Uh, as I said earlier, if you start doing really big scale deep neural network training, fundamentally it's not about who's got the fastest GPUs, it's about who's got the fastest networking between machines. Um, so there are some benefits I'll talk about a little bit later maybe around the way that GPUs and InfiniBand work together. The TLDR is if you're going to build your own machine learning cluster, uh, InfiniBand is great. Uh, and unfortunately, if you're trying to optimize for multiple machines, you can't get away with using GTX cards because uh, the GeForce cards, our friends at NVIDIA cripple them so that they don't work with uh, GPU Direct. Uh, which was required for high performance path from GPU through to InfiniBand network adapter. Anyway, we're not going to talk about deep neural network training today. So a few concepts around batch. Um, so ultimately this is about how we map uh, an algorithm out to a cluster of machines. When you work with batch, you start up one or more pools of machines. Those pools can contain both standard and low priority VMs. So standard machines are anywhere from sort of six, six well, low priority VMs, anywhere from sort of a 60 to 90% discount off standard. So to give you a gauge, um, our NC24 V3 machines have four Volta GPUs. So four V100s, uh, they're about 14 bucks on on normal dyne per hour and a buck forty per hour on uh, on low priority. Uh, that's still not cheap enough to arbitrage mining bitcoins and Ethereum because um, I tried. <laughs> uh, did the math on that, um, but it's actually a really really cheap way of getting a lot a lot of GPU compute power. Um, Batch was built around this idea of job distribution. So basically it's a, it's a queuing and job distribution mechanism and that's really important for these highly parallelizable workloads because literally you want to treat you know, every job as, as fungible and you can just splat the jobs around all over the cluster. Um, there are some benefits with that in terms of being able to run heterogeneous clusters. Um, which is, which is good for these sort of embarrassingly parallel workloads. No good if you're training uh, deep neural nets. Deep neural net, you want uh, a homogenous cluster of the same size machines. Uh, so basically, you'll create jobs, and within a job, there's one or more tasks. Batch will manage um, mediating those tasks out around the cluster. And in the case of low priority VMs, which can get killed at any time if we want the capacity back, that's the quid pro quo for giving you a 90% discount. Uh, if we shoot the VM, Batch is going to start another one, and it's going to replay those tasks that weren't able to complete. So it's reasonably fire and forget, you know, and there are strategies for dealing with those preemptible VMs, like running multiple pools, running pools of different size machines, keeping a good track of which machines get shot most frequently, um, and maybe changing machine types to minimize uh, the amount of downtime. The thing is that once you're into, you know, pools of hundreds or thousands of cores, actually, you know, you're kind of going to get stuff shot. But stuff's going to fall over anyway, uh, so you might as well be uh, durable to that. You want to have some sort of stateful storage back end um, and push and pull state uh, out of durable storage because these machines are ultimately not durable. <coughs> 
I won't go through this in detail, but I'll make sure that we've got some slides that are going up on a website somewhere afterwards. Yes, awesome. So these can go up on the slides. I mean, key things to call out are it's cross-platform, so obviously it can run anything you want. Uh, my strong, strong guidance is to run Linux and not run Windows on it unless you really need to run Windows workloads. The reason being that we, while we discount the virtual machine time, we don't discount the Windows license. Um, right, so, uh, so suddenly you've got this $1.40 Volta machine that's using a whole lot of cores and you're paying like two bucks for a Windows license and a buck forty for your GPUs. Um, so just, j unless you really need to run Windows, like you know, you've got some crazy DASO system simulation environment and it only runs on Windows, run Linux. Um, pick your poison, Ubuntu, uh, Red Hat, CentOS, whatever. Um, the low priority VMs are the key to this, uh, and I think I even pulled up the pricing page just before for shits and giggles. Um, so go have a look at the pricing page, right? Um, you know, so these are these are pretty quick machines, 64 vCPUs, 64 cents an hour on low priority. Um, with those embarrassingly parallel workloads you don't necessarily need to run the biggest machine every time, right? Because again, you can, if you're chunking these workloads up into nice small discrete units, then actually you might be better to run 32 D D2s rather than one D64, right? It just means you've got a li little bit more resilience if we start shooting machines. Um, so it's a pretty sophisticated um, job orchestration engine that, that is tightly coupled to the way Azure works, which means it really understands uh, how things operate in terms of optimizing job distribution around uh, the data center um, and uh, things like that. As I said, low priority VMs are the key there. Uh, built on top of that, we have a thing called Bat Shipyard. Uh, it's in GitHub. Uh, it's basically a dockerization framework on top of Azure Batch, so as long as you can dockerize your workload, it makes it super easy to, to um, get stuff running in Batch with complex machine configurations, and complex machine configurations that are still reasonably lightweight, right? A lot of people, the kind of a default fallback is you start up your Batch cluster using the Azure Data Science VM base image, which is basically a Windows or a Linux VM loaded to the gills, the latest Anaconda, the latest TensorFlow, the latest bloody everything. Um, that's great, except it's kind of ginormous, which means when machines start getting shot, it takes a long time to stand them back up again. Uh, so you really do want to, for a really big job workload, you want to be aggressive in terms of how you optimize your images to get as fast a startup as possible. Batch Shipyard lets you do that. Um, by default, we have all the underlying support, including um, NVIDIA Docker, uh, to make it really easy to run uh, Dockerized deep learning workflows. Um, so that's really good for both MPI type scenarios, i.e., you know, TensorFlow, CNTK, blah, 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 as well as highly parallelizable scenarios. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about today, seeing as nobody has talked about R yet. Uh, is a thing called uh, Do Azure Parallel. Again, up on GitHub uh, with a bunch of uh, examples. Uh, and Do Azure Parallel is a parallel backend that uses Azure Batch uh, as the backend execution engine. So the way that R works for parallelization uh, is that you register a parallel backend and then a number of other R libraries, things like the for each library uh, and other you know, parallel list suppliers and things use that parallel backend to distribute their work. Do Azure Parallel is a parallel backend that's able to distribute work out across Azure Batch. Uh, and I had a demo but I got off the plane and it wasn't working, but that's okay because I can at least show you the code. Uh, it's not that one. So let me take you through. Is that visible? I need to make it a bit bigger. At the back? Bigger? Yeah. They nod. 
tools, options. For those of you sitting there, this is R, fantastic programming language. <laughs> we have this little thing going on, right? Let's try that. Big enough? Okay. So pretty simple. Uh, make sure you've got DevTools installed because we pull this stuff out of GitHub. Um, we, have a, we have an R library called R Azure Batch, which is a library for working with batch clusters because there will be situations where you just want to work with batch natively. And then this thing called Do Azure Parallel, right, which is just like things like Do Snow and other parallel backends. Install both of those, load the libraries, configure some credentials, and the credentials are pretty simple. Um, so the credentials are really just, um, if you take a photograph of that, you'll be able to log in and use my batch account and stand up all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, we're not going to put, I'll, I'll make sure we remove this after the video. Um, so we basically configure a batch account with a key to access and a URL, a storage account, again a key to access, I'm going to flush those keys as soon as we're done here. <laughs> Don't even get any ideas, right, and there's probably... There's a, little bit of, there's a little bit of entropy off the end too uh, that you're going to have to work through. <laughs> um, then we specify our cluster configuration. So in this case, I've specified that I want my, my pool to use D2, V2 machines, and I want to use low priority machines, right? So I'm going to use my entire pool is using low pri machines, three nodes of D2, V2, so those D2s are going to give me a couple of CPU cores, and they're going to cost me not a lot. Or V3 is going to cost me two cents an hour, right? Um, and they're pretty, they're reasonably chunky GPU cores, right? 2673 V4 GPU, CPU cores. Um, so that's probably as good as most people have on their workstation. Certainly, uh, they're nicer CPU cores than my workstation at home. Uh, we can specify it to auto scale. In this case, auto scale is not going to do diddly squat because we've said min size and max size are the same. But we can actually configure this so that we specify a min size of 1, a max size of 30, and based on queue length, Azure Batch will automatically stand up and tear down machines based on the queue length and based on how fast those jobs are executing and we're flushing the queue. We then specify a Docker container and this is just going to go and pull that Docker container directly out of Docker Hub. So piece of cake, push your Docker container to Docker Hub, run the thing, Bob's your auntie's living lover, off you go. Um, then we specify the R packages that we want it to install. Uh, it can install from CRAN, it can install from Bioconductor, it can install from GitHub, and actually it can also install from a private GitHub repo. Um, you need to provide a GitHub uh, access token in the credentials, which I haven't done. But if you want to install um, either private Docker containers uh, or um, out of private GitHub repos. <clears throat> uh, so run through, load, load everything, create our cluster, and then it's going to boot that cluster up, and it, it's... It's synchronous for that call, so it's going to wait until the whole cluster is up before it starts dishing jobs up out of that. And from there in, it's literally just a case of running any old R code that uses a parallel backend. So in this case, this demo uses uh, the Carrot uh, machine learning meta framework. Anybody use Carrot? Read the book by a guy called Max Kuhn, K-U-H-N. Great book, great library. It's basically a meta framework for doing things like cross-validation, um, you know, data encoding and things like that. Uh, so we can use this for cross-validation, hyperparameter optimization of, say, a random forest, GBM, uh, and so forth. Load some data, split, create a fit control. So the fit control is the way that we tell Carrot um, what we want it to do. So in this case, we tell it to do a repeated cross-validation 10 times um, using 10 folds. And we're going to do a random search across um, a hyperparameter space. Allow parallel equals true basically tells it to use the parallel back end 
and we've registered that we're going to use Do Azure Parallel as our parallel backend. So basically what's going to happen now when I execute this on my local machine, it's actually going to push these tasks out to Azure and execute them in the Azure backend. Um, so off my local machine. If you've got a big data set, you're probably not going to want to do this off your local machine into the cloud. You're probably going to want to have a two-step process where you've got some sort of workstation running in the cloud um, and you kick the whole process off up there so you're not talking over the worldwide internet uh, to get your data up there. You know, and literally it's then just a case of running train, and this is what's not working for me at the moment. Um, so you just run train and that's going to use the parallel backend to execute, um, execute your work. Once you're finished, stop the cluster. Um, that's going to tear everything back down um, and get you back to spending zero dollars. Thoughts? Interesting? Anybody doing this already? Anybody got a nice cluster at work? No? Because this, I mean, the, the nice thing about this is that you don't pay anything unless you're using it. Um, so it's, and then you can have as much as you want as long as you've got a good credit card limit. Um, so that's, that's do Azure Parallel. And again, anything that you can parallelize in R, you can spread across a cluster using do Azure Parallel. Uh, then we have this thing called uh, Batch AI, and Batch AI is uh, basically a deep learning optimized, a optimized service built across the top of Batch. This is what I showed last time, I won't go into it in a whole lot of detail, but basically if you're doing distributed deep learning, uh, then Batch AI gives you a bunch of simple Python uh, and command line APIs to be able to uh, execute your deep neural network training at scale. Um, and there's a recording on the Singapore Tech recording website where I'll talk through using, what's it called? FOSS Asia. Asia website. On the FOSS Asia website, uh, there's a thing on using a tool called Horovod to train TensorFlow models, and it's basically a distributed uh, optimizer for TensorFlow. Uh, so if you need to run big TensorFlow models, uh, it's a good way to go. Um, lots of data storage options, um, and, and again, it's going to be a case of optimizing your approach to data storage based on things like how long your tasks run. Um, uh, so you'll need to decide if you want to actually pull data local uh, or read data off a remote store every time. Um, local disk, uh, we have a thing called Azure Files, which is basically um, a file share built atop, across the top of Azure Storage. Uh, we have a thing called Azure Blobs, which if you're familiar with AWS is basically like S3. Uh, and then we have a Fuse driver for that. So if you're using Linux, you can basically mount a blob straight into Linux as a native um, HBA using Fuse, which is kind of sweet. Uh, we've got Manage NFS. Um, and then for really big scenarios, you may want to take advantage of the fact that Batch Shipyard actually supports standing up parallel file clusters. Um, things like Lustre, Gluster, and so forth. Um, pretty much mount your file share and uh, get after it. Um, I'm a big fan of getting my data into my fastest data store first. Uh, so for example, if I'm training uh, a deep learning model, I am not going to read many batches over the network, and you're not going to either. Um, because all you're going to do is choke on uh, file I.O. and you're going to leave your GPU sitting there idle and while I'd love to take your money, um, it's a bad idea. Uh, so please pull your data locally, um, especially if you run a big machine with lots of RAM, it can actually be a good idea to just pull that and stick it in a RAM disk. Because uh, again, you want to be as optimized as possible for getting data through the CPU or GPU. How do you have the time? Two minutes. Let's talk quickly about hardware in the cloud. Uh, tip number one, GPU direct is really important. So GPU direct is the mechanism by which uh, your GPU can talk directly to your InfiniBand adapter. If you don't have an InfiniBand adapter, well, that's kind of shitty. Um, but if you do have an InfiniBand adapter, um, then this is really important. Um, 
and unfortunately that means you have to be using the Tesla class um, GPUs from NVIDIA because they disable it for um, the, the GTX cards. Uh, in terms of the, the GPUs running in our clouds, uh, we've got Volta GPUs uh, currently is our nicest GPU. Um, and the biggest machine we have is 4x V100s uh, with a 56-gig with a InfiniBand adapter in it. Uh, I've spoken a bit about the spare capacity VMs, which is um, really Azure Batch. You know, and then sort of final tips and tricks, uh, point number one, use Linux. Uh, and that really is so that you're getting full advantage of the low priority VM prices because we don't discount the Windows license. Really the only reason to be running Windows for your HPC workloads in Azure is if you really need a Windows operating system to be supported by your third party software vendor. Um, otherwise you're much better to run Linux. Um, and then just make sure that you are fully utilizing all the hardware that you have. So optimize your task size and your job size and batch um, to take full advantage uh, and optimize your data pipeline so that you're not doing things like your data prep while you've got an expensive cluster stood up. Uh, scale for, for, the, um, for the tightly coupled workloads, um, scale up, biggest, biggest CPU, biggest GPU first, then out more GPUs in a single machine, and then out into multiple nodes, right? So don't find yourself running like half a dozen NC6 machines all with a single GPU in them, right? Actually stand up machines with more GPUs before you break out into to running multiple machines. Um, and then as I said, job and cluster management tool makes it really easy. Um, so if you're doing anything with R, um, and particularly if you're going to use any, something like MLR or Carrot or one of those, those meta-learning frameworks, um, this gives you really cheap and easy access to a compute cluster to do things like grid searches and stuff. So if you like to overfit to the Kaggle public leaderboard, this is a really excellent way of doing it because you can tune the crap out of your hyperparameters and be the most overfit model in the public leaderboard. Sorry, that's an inside joke for the Kagglers in the room. Hope that was useful. God, I'm tired now, guys. <laughs> really good to talk. Uh, I'm Chris from Microsoft. Uh, I run an engineering team here in Singapore, so we basically build cool shit with customers. Uh, and I am hiring deep learning and machine learning people at the moment, three open heads. So uh, if that sounds like you, uh, find me on LinkedIn really easy uh, and hit me up for a coffee. <laughs> Cheers. Questions, queries, thoughts, comments? Everybody's blown away. Did I talk slowly enough? Yeah. No? This dude's got one. So, so in Why the demo, not? like, you basically, it's a case of embarrassingly parallel, right? But in, let's say if you want to do a really big regression in R, because I have like a lot of data. So yep. What, what would you suggest? Um, so do a really big regression in R because I've got lots of data. Um, you mean my first port of call is just to run a really, really, really big machine. You know, so I mean literally, if, if you, if you want to do that, the easiest way to do it is run a really big machine. Um, so both ourselves and Amazon have really big machines. So by big machines, I'm talking, you know, a couple of terabytes of RAM. Then you can load your data set into RAM and process a couple of terabytes in RAM. If that's still too hard, there are external memory libraries for R. Um, so there's a bunch of sort of free and open source ones. We, we have a commercial one um, that's part of the Microsoft R server product. And we bought the technology from a company called Revolution Analytics that we have a, an external memory library and a bunch of machine learning libraries that take advantage of that. So, they, so basically the data stays on disk and we stream it through the machine learning algorithm. Does that help to answer that question? Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Can I see Chris's hand? Thanks guys.